Hello, I'm Alma Angeles, and you're watching Eagle News International. And I'm CJ Hero. Welcome to the program. Now on tonight's headlines. Trump. Mr. Democrat Donald Trump and Joe Biden, Biden head, to head to Georgia on Monday to rally their party faithful ahead of twin runoffs that will decide who controls the U.S. Senate one day after the release of a bombshell recording of the outgoing president that rocked Washington. Schools and colleges close across Britain ahead of a national lockdown as the country battles to contain surging coronavirus cases that are threatening to overwhelm its health care system. Tokyo's annual New Year tuna auction ends without the usual jaw-dropping bidding war, with the country's tuna king holding back on gunning for the top fish, citing the pandemic woes affecting the restaurant history. And Singapore has admitted data collected for contact tracing can be accessed by police despite earlier assurances it would only be used to fight the coronavirus, sparking privacy concerns Tuesday about the scheme. President Donald Trump on Monday implored Georgians to save America and re-elect Republicans in two runoffs that will determine U.S. Senate control and could decisively impact the start of Joe Biden's White House tenure. Meanwhile, President-elect Joe Biden have urged voters in Georgia to turn out for the elections on Tuesday that will decide which party controls the Senate. Let's listen in. The Democrats are trying to steal the White House. You cannot let them. You just can't let them steal the U.S. Senate. You can't let it happen. You can't let it happen. David and Ken And I hope Mike Pence comes through for us, I have to tell you. I hope that our great vice president, our great vice president comes through for us. He's a great guy. Of course, if he doesn't come through, I won't like him quite as much. If you don't go and vote, the socialists, the Marxists will be in charge of our country. If you don't fight to save your country with everything you have, you're not going to have a country left. And I'm not happy with the Supreme Court. They are not stepping up to the plate. They're not stepping up. How about that? We don't have, look at the Supreme Court, President of the United States, I want to file suit. I want to do, and they said, sir, you can't, you really can't do that, why? I have an announcement, Georgia. On January 6th, I will object to the Electoral College vote. By electing John and the Reverend, you'll be voting to get the states the resources they need to get the vaccines distributed. It's a shame what's happening now. The president spends more time whining and complaining than doing something about the problem. I don't know why he still wants the job. He doesn't want to do the work. If you send John and the Reverend to Washington, those $2,000 checks will go out the door, restoring hope and decency and honor for so many people who are struggling right now. And if you send Senators Perdue and Loeffler back to Washington, those checks will never get there. It's just that simple. The power is literally in your hand. And I'm proud to be an American. The Republican Senate incumbents in Georgia, Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue, are trying to hold off the Democratic challengers, John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock. Georgia has been reliably Republican, but Biden beat Trump by nearly 12,000 votes in the Peach State in November's election. And polls have the Senate races neck and neck. Republicans hold 50 seats in the 100-member Senate. A victory in just one runoff would give them a majority and the ability to thwart Joe Biden's agenda. 
A Democratic sweep would result in a 50-50 split with Democrats holding the tie-breaking vote in incoming Vice President Kamala Harris. Now, this would be crucial for pushing through Mr. Biden's progressive agenda, including key issues such as health care and environmental regulations, issues with strong Republican opposition. The Senate also has the power to approve or reject Mr. Biden's nominees for cabinet and judicial posts. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has threatened to sack airport staff after he received reports that people are allowed easy entry into the country despite strict protocols regarding travel bans. Authorities are temporarily banning the entry of foreign travelers from countries and territories that have confirmed cases of the new COVID-19 variant linked to the recent surge of coronavirus cases in England. Watch this. No. There are reports that some people are skipping na nakakalusot sila with the help of airport personnel at sa mga barko. I say this now as I have said it before, do not do it. Kasi mayayari talaga kayo. You do it by allowing an authorized travel when, up, when over all of us are really worried of containing the contamination na uh, control in and out. Almost every country now are controlling the entry and the departure of their citizens. Hindi lang tayo. Mga Pilipino, hindi lang tayo. So, do not go into this rigmarole of, uh, you know, uh, magsabi ka doon, tapos na, ganun, ganun. You, you, you bring your uh, uh, fake certificate. Yan, yan talaga ang maghanap kayo ng gulo. At yung mga taga-airport, alam mo, hindi ba ninyo nahalata na lahat ng lahat ng immigration personnel dyan, but 42 of them, at marami pang iba ang na-dismiss sa trabaho. Gusto ninyo ulitin ko yan? Uh, you know, this can only happen with the co not that even cooperation, but with the handiwork of if maybe a few, not all, people in the airports making it easy for uh, somebody to travel to skip the swabbing and everything. Sino bang may gusto nito? Uh, itong pasen incoming passengers papasok papasok sa Pilipinas uh, galing foreign countries uh, quarantine talaga mandatory 14 days lahat ng countries dito sa mundong ito yan ang ginagawa kasi ito is the safeguard so Pag may pumasok isa dito, isa lang. Look, kayong mga taga-health dyan, sa taga-quarantine, pagka uh, may na, may na huli lang ako na isa, I will, lahat kayo, palitan ko. Despite the ongoing travel ban, a traveler from Japan managed to get into the city but was intercepted at the Davao International Airport and brought to a designated patient care center here, Mayor Sara Duterte said Monday. In a radio interview, the mayor said the lady passenger arrived on New Year's Day. The Philippines has banned flights from the UK from December 24th to 31st due to concerns over the spread of a new variant of COVID-19, the virus that 
that causes the coronavirus disease 2019 emerging in the UK. The travel ban was extended no. until January 15, 2021, and those arriving from countries with reported cases, including Japan, of the new variant would undergo the required 14-day quarantine regardless of RT-PCR results. Mayor Sarah Duterte said the same protocol is being implemented at the DIA for arriving passengers, whether residents or non-residents of Davao City. Meanwhile, England entered a strict national lockdown to curb the spread of COVID infections. Aribel Celestino joins us live from the United Kingdom. Hello, Aribel. Hi, Alma. And yes, England entered a strict national lockdown aimed at stemming a steep rise in virus cases that a senior government minister warned could last into March. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the measures, including schools closure and a ban on leaving home except for exercise and essential shopping on Monday evening. Let's listen in. That means the government is once again instructing you to stay at home. You may only leave home for limited reasons permitted in law, such as to shop for essentials, to work if you absolutely cannot work from home, to exercise, to seek medical assistance, such as getting a COVID test, or to escape domestic abuse. Today, the United Kingdom's chief medical officers have advised that the country should move to alert level five, meaning that uh, if action is not taken, NHS capacity may be overwhelmed within 21 days. If our understanding of the virus doesn't change dramatically once again, if the rollout of the vaccine program continues to be successful, if deaths start to fall as the vaccine takes effect, and critically, if everyone plays their part by following the rules, then I hope we can steadily move out of lockdown, reopening schools after the February half term and starting cautiously to move regions down the tiers. Michael Gove told Sky News on Tuesday morning that he could not say precisely when the lockdown announced as lasting six weeks would be lifted, warning of very, very difficult weeks. The measures will be reviewed from February 15, he said, but the government cannot predict with certainty whether they will be lifted then. The measures begin in England on Tuesday morning and will become law in the early hours of Wednesday morning. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are also bringing in strict lockdowns, including school of, uh, closures of school. The lockdown comes as the surge of new strain of the virus that is said to be more infectious, threatens to overwhelm hospitals despite the rollout of two vaccines, including UK's own U Oxford University AstraZeneca shot from Monday, bringing hopes of beating the, uh, the virus in the coming months. The UK has already vaccinated over 1 million people. A total of 58,784 people tested positive in the UK on Monday, with cases in the last seven days up 50% on the previous week. Over to you, Alma. Well, you also mentioned schools are also uh, closing in Britain as part of the national lockdown. Can you tell us, uh, tell us more about this and what support will be given to students? Yes, Alma, that's right. In England, all schools will not open until at least February half term. So you can imagine the distress and inconvenience this will cause parents for the last minute changes, Alma. Mm -hmm. Primary and secondary schools will move to remote, uh, remote learning for most students. The only pupils that can go to school physically will be the vulnerable children and whose parents are critical workers. Mm -hmm. Universities and colleges will use remote learning to teach uh, students until mid-February but courses for future critical workers are exempt. Also, Alma, um, there are students who are entitled to free school meals, and Prime Minister Boris Johnson said 
they will give extra support to ensure they continue to receive them while schools are closed. He also said that more electronic devices will be available to support remote, uh, remote learning, Alma. Mm -hmm. Back here. Uh, what about the rest of the UK? Uh, are they imposing similar restrictions on schools? Well, Alma, yes. Uh, well, Alma, um, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland are also reopening later than usual. Mm -hmm. Scotland schools will stay close to most students until 1st of February mm -hmm. using remote learning. Universities and colleges can use a more restrict, uh, restricted mix of face-to-face -face and distance learning. Mm -hmm. In Wales, uh, schools and colleges will use online learning until the 18th of January, except children of critical workers, vulnerable ones, and learners who need to complete important exams or assessments. Mm -hmm. And in Northern Ireland, primary schools uh, will use online learning until the 11th on, of January. In secondary schools, year 8 to 11 will do the same all of January, while year 12 to 14 are set to go back to school from the second week of January. Back to you, Alma. All right. Thank you very much for your update, Aribel. Stay safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Alma. Reporting from the United Kingdom, I'm Aribel Celestino. We live in interesting times. With a mixture of disappointment and resignation, people in London react to a new strict national lockdown in England that could last until March, aimed at stemming a steep rise in virus cases. Let's listen in. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with it. It, it. There is nothing that can be done. There's no way around it. And it's a short-term solution just to ease what's happening in the NHS. I, I really don't have a problem with it. If it's getting worse and like the infection rate's going up and more, more and more people are being affected by it, I, I believe so, yeah. But I mean, as far as it goes for people like myself, like, nothing's really changed. You know? People that can work from home can work from home, but people that have jobs where they physically have to be there, I suppose it'll be us that are like the worst affected, you know. It's just exasperated because I don't know if, if people can just go that extra mileage another six weeks um, uh, with this lockdown. It's just crazy. Um, uh, you know, you can't. I mean, you, there's a few shops open, thank God. You know, Marks and Spencer, so you can still get food there. But um, it's it's just the way things is handled with the government, Boris Johnson, and the whole COVID thing. Overall, Britain has been among the worst hit in the world by the outbreak with some 2.7 million cases and 75,431 deaths. Prime Minister Boris Johnson was widely criticized for hesitating too long about the measures, particularly school closures, but he won some support on Tuesday. The Times wrote, Mr. Johnson said that the weeks ahead would be the hardest yet, but at least we have given ourselves a fighting chance. Under England's new measures, support and child care bubbles will continue and people can meet one person from another household for outdoor exercise. Exercise should be limited to once per day. Communal worship and funerals can continue, subject to limits on attendance. Weddings are allowed in exceptional circumstances with up to six people. Mr. Johnson said the new variant of coronavirus, which is up to 70% more transmissible, was spreading in a frustrating and alarming manner and warned that the number of COVID-19 patients in English hospitals is 40% higher than the first peak. And staying in Europe, Italy postponed the return of high schools as part of new coronavirus restrictions. As a charity also warned that thousands of students were dropping out after months of distance learning. Teenagers will return to class on January 11 instead of January 7 when younger children go back to school but then still only for half their time under a new government order. Many face further delays as several regions had already decided to postpone the return of high schools until the end of January, judging them too risky. 
Italian teens have only been in face-to-face -face classes for a few months in the past year due to the spring lockdown and further restrictions imposed at the start of a second wave in the autumn. Italy has been one of the country's worst hit by the pandemic with more than 75,000 deaths so far. The charity Save the Children warned on Tuesday that the pandemic had severely affected the lives of millions of youngsters and said distance learning had caused perhaps irreparable damage. It published a survey of 14 to 18-year-olds in which 28% said they had at least one classmate who stopped attending lessons, warning tens of thousands of school students may be dropping out. Now, under mounting pressure to speed up coronavirus vaccinations, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison on Tuesday said he would not take unnecessary risks and emulate Britain's emergency drug approval. While vaccinations are already well underway in many countries, Australia's pharmaceutical authority is not expected to rule on candidate drugs for around another month and is aiming to administer the first doses by the end of March. Pressed about that seemingly sluggish timetable, Morrison, who early in the pandemic boasted Australia would be at the forefront of the queue for any vaccine, suggested virus-ravaged countries like Britain had been forced to take risks with emergency approvals. To quote, Australia is not in an emergency situation like the United Kingdom, so we don't have to cut corners, we don't have to take unnecessary risks, the conservative leader told local radio station 3AW. Australia had largely eliminated community transmission, but is currently battling to contain small clusters of the disease in the country's biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne. And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. This portion is brought to you by Canary Corporation, your ventilation and air conditioning specialist. Services offered, supply and installation of elevators, escalators, air conditioners, ventilators, jet towel hand dryers, generators, access control system, Factory automation and modernization. For more info, please contact Ami Kanke at 0915-263-7198 or 0998-900-3224. Aquino here at Hatley Castle, one of the filming locations for the X-Men series. Don't forget to tune in to Digital Nest only on Net25. Financial markets have started the year with some positivity following news of a Brexit deal and the rollout of multiple COVID-19 vaccines through short-term risks of the virus, though short-term risks of the virus may remain underpriced. According to market analyst Craig Erlam of Owanda Forex Trading, let's listen in. We have to remember that December was uh, a massive risk month as far as these markets were concerned. There were a lot of issues that needed to be overcome uh, and it seemed every single one of them delivered. We got our Brexit deal. Uh, the US dis delivered its fiscal stimulus, avoided a government shutdown. The Europeans uh, avoided any issues over their budget for 21 through 27. And to cap things off, we got a numerous vaccines which have already now started being rolled out. That's a, that, that's a huge amount of event risk which has been overcome last month. And I think that's flowing through to some positivity at the start of this year. It's fine. 
the, the markets didn't really get overly nervous. We saw little bits of nervousness creeping in at times, but the markets didn't get too nervous heading into this deadline. So there, there remained a confidence in these markets that a deal was going to be struck, and that confidence has been rewarded. We've seen some gains to the upside, but they've been quite small under the circumstances. Any, in, 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 in the grand scheme of things, I think Brexit now is in the rearview mirror, mirror. The, 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 the caveat being that if the economy does suffer more than is anticipated as a result of the divorce, then, then, then it could come back to, uh, to haunt these markets. Uh, so across many countries, we are seeing uh, a severe wave of COVID, and I think that is a major downside risk still for this first quarter. I think to an extent, even now, the, the, the near-term risks posed by uh, COVID-19 are, are still uh, being uh, a little bit ignored uh, as far as the markets are concerned. I think longer term, the vaccine does solve that, and maybe the markets are buying heavily into that. But I think very near-term risks, um, the, 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 COVID, the, the COVID situation very much does fall into that category. And I think these lockdowns are going to persist until at least the end of January, maybe beyond, which... European stock markets rallied Monday, boosted by takeover activity, Brexit relief and vaccine-driven economic optimism on the first trading day of 2021. London's FTSE 100 shares index gained 2.8% on the first day since Britain finalized a divorce from the EU. As dealers noted, no signs of the Brexit chaos some had feared. The pound briefly reached 2.5-year peak at $1.3704 before pulling back to 1.3628. It gave up around 1% against the euro to 90.22 pence. Meanwhile, Scotland on Monday announced a nationwide lockdown for the rest of January. The UK launched an extra £4.6 billion package for virus-battered businesses as it entered a fresh lockdown set to last weeks. The financial support, equivalent to $6.3 billion or 5.1 billion euros, will help businesses to get through the months ahead and crucially, it will help sustain jobs so workers can be ready to return when they are able to reopen, Finance Minister Rishi Sunak said in a statement. Sunak announced grants for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses worth up to £9,000 per property to help businesses through the next several months. Other impacted businesses would share £594 million, added the Chancellor of Exchequer. The UK government has already pumped out billions of pounds in support since early 2020 when the nation went into a first lockdown over the coronavirus, sending national debt soaring. At the heart of the support is the state's furlough scheme, paying the bulk of wages for millions of private sector workers. The Bank of England is also pumping out vast sums of cash to prop up the devastated economy. And the New York Stock Exchange abandoned plans to delist three state-owned Chinese telecom companies on Monday, reversing a decision that further dented already strained relations between the world's two superpowers. In a brief statement, the stock exchange said no longer intends, it no longer intends to move forward with the delisting action for China Telecom, China Mobile and China Unicom. No detailed reason was given for the sudden reversal, which the exchange said came after further consultation with relevant regulatory authorities. In response, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Chunying said the initial U.S. move to delist the three companies reflected the arbitrariness, capriciousness and uncertainty of its rules and systems. And uh, she added this will harm U.S. national interests and its own image. Shares in the three state-owned telecoms firms jumped on the news. In Hong Kong, trading of China Unicom, which at one point soared 11 percent, ended up at more than 8 percent. China Mobile climbed more than 5 percent and China Telecom added more than 3 percent. Mainland Chinese shares reversed earlier losses, while the yuan rose around 0.7% against the dollar. 
In other news, U.S. and Kuwaiti officials said Saudi Arabia will reopen its borders and airspace to Qatar, a major step towards ending a diplomatic rift that has seen Riyadh lead an alliance isolating Doha. The bombshell announcement came on the eve of the Six Nation Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC annual summit in the northwestern Saudi Arabian city of Al Ula, where the dispute was already set to top the agenda. In another sign, the three and a half year spat was nearing resolution. The office of Qatari Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Atani said that he would attend after he skipped the annual meetings for the last three years. Riyadh led a coalition of countries in the Gulf and beyond that cut ties with Doha in June 2017, charging that it was too close to Tehran and backed radical Islamist groups, allegations that Qatar has always denied. Washington has intensified pressure for a resolution to what Doha calls a blockade, insisting Gulf unity is necessary to isolate U.S. nemesis Iran as the curtain falls on Donald Trump's presidency. Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor, shuttled around the region to seek a deal and will attend the signing on Tuesday of the breakthrough. In other news, Tokyo's Toyosu Fish Market held its first tuna auction of 2021 on Tuesday before dawn. Buyers and rubber boots inspect the quality of giant fresh and frozen tunas by examining the neatly cut tail end with flashlights and rubbing slices between their fingers. Now, the most expensive fish of the day, a 208-kilogram bluefin caught off the northern Aomori region of Japan, known for its quality tuna, and was bought by a bidder for 20.84 million yen or 202,000 U.S. dollars. Take a look. Singapore has admitted data collected for contact tracing can be accessed by police despite earlier assurances it would only be used to fight the coronavirus, sparking privacy concerns Tuesday about the scheme. The city-state has a program called Trace Together for tracking close contacts of COVID-19 patients that works via both a phone app and a dongle. A senior official admitted in Parliament that police could obtain any data, including information gathered through the contact tracing program, in the course of a criminal investigation. 
Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishan said later that, to his knowledge, police had so far only accessed contact tracing data on one occasion during a murder probe. Human Rights Watch accused the government, which is regularly criticized for curtailing civil liberties, of undermining the right to privacy. Speaking in Parliament Tuesday, Balakrishan said the government was just being open when it made the admission. But there was much anger online, which some Singaporeans saying they felt betrayed. The city-state has only suffered a mild outbreak with about 58,000 cases and 29 deaths. Eagle News, we'll be right back. Don't go away. This portion is brought to you by Kubert, an expert in air conditioning and electromechanical. Also engage in structural, electrical, fire protection, plumbing, and sanitary services. Kubert, your ultimate MEPS and air conditioning solutions. Mula noon hanggang ngayon. Gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Welcome back. Hong Kong's outgoing top judge made a plea on Tuesday to maintain judicial independence as China state media and a growing host of pro-Beijing figures call for an overhaul of how the financial hub's courts are run. Semi-autonomous Hong Kong owes much of its business success to a transparent and internationally respected common law legal system that stands in stark contrast with the opaque party-controlled courts in authoritarian China. But that system has come under sustained pressure in the politically charged wake of 2019's huge pro-democracy protests and Beijing's subsequent crackdown. Last year, Beijing began asserting more direct control over the city, including imposing a sweeping national security law that silenced dissent and dented the legal firewall between the business hub and the mainland. Senior Chinese politicians, state media outlets, as well as leading pro-Beijing figures and newspapers within Hong Kong have also so lobbied for performing for reforming rather the judiciary or criticized recent judgments and sentences they dislike opponents fear those calls could presage the arrival of a legal system more akin to the authoritarian mainland on tuesday hong kong's chief justice joffrey ma 64 addressed those concerns at a final press conference ahead of his retirement Do I have any direct, as it were, because the question is, any direct interference with what um, I do, what the courts do, from the government or from uh, the main government, uh, from Beijing, the answer is no. The courts don't make the law. The courts apply the law. Applying the law is, of course, harder than you think because it requires a lot of different factors to be taken into account, different legal factors. But the courts don't invent the law. The courts don't say, in this situation, I'm not going to follow the law. I'm going to uh, step in. But when...
In other news, Iran said Tuesday it had stepped up uranium enrichment beyond the limits of its nuclear deal with the world powers, powers amid heightened tensions with arch foe the United States and after Iran seized a South Korean tanker in strategic Gulf waters. The Islamic Republic said it was now refining uranium to 20% purity, far above the level permitted under its 2015 agreement, but significantly below the 90% required for an atomic bomb, in a step Washington condemned as nuclear extortion. The European Union noted Iran's steps with deep concern and planned to redouble our efforts to preserve the agreement and return to its full implementation by all parties said EU spokesman Peter Stano. A war of words has flared again in the final weeks of the Trump presidency and at a time when Iran and its allies have marked one year since a U.S. drone strike in Baghdad killed Iran's most revered military commander, Qasem Soleimani. Washington has meanwhile reversed an order to bring home its Nimitz aircraft carrier from the Gulf, citing threats against Trump after recently also flying B-52 bombers over the region. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has warned it is ready to respond to any attack. Numerous inspections of Iran's nuclear facilities and uh, has Chinese jets made a record 380 incursions into Taiwan's defense zone last year, a defense official said, as a military linked think tank warned tensions were now at their highest since the mid 1990s. Democratic and self-ruled Taiwan lives under the constant threat of invasion by authoritarian China, which views the island as its own territory and has vowed to seize it one day by force if necessary. Beijing's animosity has increased dramatically since Taiwanese President Chai Ing-wen won election in 2016 as she rejects the idea that the island is part of one China. But the cyber rattling reached new peaks last year as Beijing sent jets bombers and surveillance planes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone at an unprecedented rate. The figures came as the military-affiliated Institute for National Defense and Security Research warned in an annual report on the People's Liberation Army that the Chinese military threat was the highest since the 1996 missile crisis in Taiwan Strait. Now that year, Beijing fired missiles into the strait in a bid to deter voters in the island's first democratic presidential election prompting Washington to send warships to the area. Meanwhile, South Korea will send a government delegation to Iran at the earliest possible date to negotiate the release of a seized oil tanker and its crew, Seoul's foreign ministry said Tuesday. On Monday, the guards launched a dramatic action on the high seas near the strategic straits of Hormuz, a choke point through which a fifth of world oil output passes. Its speedboat seized the South Korean flagged Hankook, Kemi, carrying oil chemical products and its multinational crew of 20, accusing it of having polluted seawaters. South Korea has demanded the ship's release and deployed a destroyer carrying its anti-piracy unit to the area. South Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Choi Jong-kun would go ahead with a planned three-day trip to Tehran early next week, his office said. Record-breaking sumo champion Hakuho has tested positive for COVID-19 just days before the New Year tournament, according to the Japan Sumo Association. The JSA said Hakuho has tested after noticing a loss of smell and that other members of the Miyagino stable, who are thought to have come into contact with him, would be tested today. The Mongolian-born 35-year-old who has won a record 44 tournaments and holds Sumo's highest rank of Yokozuna 
had been preparing for the 15-day New Year Grand Sumo Tournament, which starts Sunday in Tokyo. A JSA spokesperson said his participation in Basho, or tournament, was as yet undecided, but the competition was set to go ahead as scheduled. Hakuho's infection comes after 11 members of the Arashio stable tested positive last week following the infection of top division wrestler Waka Takakage. Local media reported that the new cases included stable master Arashio, a hairdresser, and eight lower division wrestlers. A geoji or referee from a different stable also tested positive on Monday after complaining of a fever and cough. A 20-year-old sumo wrestler died in Japan last May after contracting the virus and suffering multiple organ failure. Meanwhile, Philadelphia 76ers Tobias Harris shares NBA Player of the Week honors with Steph Curry. We have a Tenny Sumage for the update, Tenny. Thanks, CJ. It was a successful week for both Tobias Harris and Steph Curry. Harris's scoring and shooting percentage earned him NBA Player of the Week in the Eastern Conference. The sisters won last night against the Charlotte Hornets and are off to a great start under new head coach, Doc Rivers. We'll hear more from Harris. Take a look. It was different. Uh, I heard Coach talk about all 42 people in the stands, gave me a round of applause from leaving the last uh, 30 seconds of the game. But more so, we just had uh, a better energy to start the game where you can feed off of that. And in this league, that's that's all you really need. And, you know, we, we have some talented guys that I think that we care and we're trying to, to get to the level again that we want to be at. So when you have something to, to be excited about, you kind of feed off your own energy. Um, and, you know, things start to go your way. So there is no – I was around when, when – obviously when Clay scored 60 and there's a different environment, a different experience, and, and you understand what that's like. This was totally different, but uh, I'll take it. Has been successful for my game. It was successful in LA with Doc. So I think it's, you know, I'd be selfish to say, hey, this is what Doc is doing for me. It'd be more along like this is what Doc is doing for the whole team a as a whole. So, and um, that's holding us accountable to playing a right style of basketball and, um, you know, a, win a winning style of, of, of what he knows. So, yeah. Well, we're here right now, and we we know as a group that we got to be a great defensive team. Um, on top of that, we, we have to share the basketball, play off each other's strengths on the floor, and um, just just find a rhythm. We, we said from the beginning we got to get out to a great start, and we have to be able to really push push ourselves. When we're up 10 points, get up 15, get up 20. So uh, we can't relax out there, but the mentality is uh, really good for my whole our whole uh, whole team, and we just gotta we just gotta keep it moving. Tonight, we'll have more highlights on the NBA season here on Eagle News in New York. Tani Sumagi, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, CJ. Thank you so much, Denny. More news, more, more NBA news from you in the coming days. Thank you. Stay safe out there. You too. All right, back to tech news. Norway became the first country in the world where electric cars accounted for more than 50% of new registrations in 2020, according to figures published Tuesday by an industry group. According to the Information Council for Road Traffic, electric vehicles accounted for 54.3% of the new car market last year, up from 42.4% a year earlier. The four best-selling models in the Nordic country were the Audi e-tron, the Tesla Model 3, Three, the Volkswagen ID.3 and the Nissan Leaf, all fully electric. The fifth place car, the Volkswagen Golf, can be bought in a 
rechargeable version, but the statistics do not differentiate the engine types. In December, electric car sales set a monthly record in Norway with 66.7%, with the numbers boosted by the arrival of new models, OFV said. Industry group Norsk or the Norwegian Electric Vehicle Association said that separately said separately to AFP that Norway was the first country to break the overall 50% threshold. Norway, the largest producer of oil in Western Europe, is making headway in electric mobility thanks to heavy subsidies. The Nordic country where electricity is primarily produced from hydroelectric dams aims to have all new cars being zero emission by 2025. Finally, in our news, overseas Filipino workers in Canada stay positive by sharing this fight song challenge. Here is Marjorie Quintos for that report. In the year of 2020, several lockdowns have been imposed and we all try to do something from home. But how awesome can it be when you're locked down with your colleagues that have now become your friends and family? A group of Filipino workers came to Vernon in British Columbia. They lived together, worked together, spent the holidays together. Welcome to they made some vlogs to show the beauty of Canada. Everything was going well until COVID happened. Like a small boat. To encourage fast food workers to show up for work, even if they fear COVID-19, they danced to the tune of Fight Song. Like how a single and they were joined by workers from other provinces in Canada. performance became viral that it got over a thousand shares and made it to the news in British Columbia at that week. When the government of Canada allowed for fast food restaurants to stay open, this group of friends showed everybody that life must go on and that you gotta go to work every day regardless of the fear for COVID-19. To stay positive and happy, they started dancing just whenever they get the opportunity. They dance at work, they dance at home, and they dance all together every day. So you gotta watch all of these. And because they live together and are working together, they were able to spend a great summer without violating social distancing restrictions. It is indeed true that friends are family we choose. So for 2021, this group of friends would like to challenge everyone out there to submit their story of friendship and the dance, the climb song dance that they prepared in the snow. This is Marjorie Quintos. We live in interesting times. Well, Fight Song is there definitely <laughs> the anthem yes. of 2020. And you know, we really have to thank our fast food workers because they're frontliners too, especially with the lockdowns being imposed around the world. Thank you so much. That's true. And also our OFWs over there who are working their hearts out for their families 
and staying positive at the same time. Thank you for all that you do for us and your families. That's the Filipino spirit. Yes. That's it for tonight's broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I am CJ Hero. We'll see you again tomorrow. And at the end of the day, there remains so much more to be grateful for. Amal Angeles and we, we live, live in interesting, interesting times.